thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Dave Shackelford. I'm a longtime SANS instructor and uh, course author. And I primarily focus on our penetration testing curriculum. So I, I tend to teach uh, pen testing classes much more so than, you know, sort of the defensive side of things. But I've played both roles in my career. And, and in fact, today I'd argue as a consultant, I tend to sort of balance both in many of the different engagements that I do with clients. And so I tend to work with security awareness teams. I tend to work with sort of the defense side really just as often as I do with red teams and the offensive practitioners. And what I tend to find is that we've really sort of, I think, turned the corner in the world of information security with regard to realizing the attackers have you know, some fairly well-known methods that we can sort of replicate and attempt to employ in learning how to best detect these things that these guys are doing and ultimately to, to sort of improve on our practices across the board, both technically and sort of within the user realm as well. And so what I want to do today, and the reason that Lance has been kind enough to uh, ask me to join you guys, is, is really just to talk about some of the things that I would normally have pen testers do in order to really emulate attacker types of techniques and, and you know, kind of go the route of what an attacker might do, trying to socially engineer your users into giving up information or even potentially providing access to assets or facilities and so forth. So I'll pause just a moment. It sounds like Lance might have jumped in here. Lance, are you there? Yeah. The uh, software just totally locked up on me. Thanks for the save there, Dave. I owe you a beer. But uh, folks, I'm going to make this real short. Dave is the star of the show here. Really what we've done here is we, in the security awareness community, are always trying to better understand, hey, how can we protect people? And to protect people, we need to know what to protect them from. So we thought we'd bring one of the world's best penetration engineers, especially from the social engineering side, and ask him to share his real stories and lessons learned. So Dave's not going to cover just theory, but he's going to actually cover the tools and techniques he and others use to get into organizations. So we in the security awareness community know better who to protect against and how. Finally, what's really neat about Dave is him and one other SANS instructor, James Lyon, have built an amazing two-day class called Social Engineering for Pen Testers. Now while it's designed primarily for pen testers, what's great for the class is for those of you who are in the security awareness community, I recommend consider taking the class. For two days, you sit from the bad guy's perspective and learn how to hack into an organization. And in fact, we're going to be offering this two-day class at the Security Awareness Summit in Nashville next year in August. For the security awareness folks out there, that's a wonderful opportunity not only to learn from the summit, but from today's class. So I'm going to hand it back to Dave here, and I've asked him to share not only a lot of theory, but a lot of really good stories. So Dave, thanks, and back to you. Cool, thanks Lance. And um, you know, as I sort of said just a moment ago leading into this, uh, I, I am going to sort of cover the gamut here. And really what I like to do is set the stage with some things that I would normally introduce to penetration testers and, and sort of get their head in the game, as it were, when you're talking about the people and the people side of things. But what we realize here is that um, a little bit of psychology goes a long way. So I will jump in and, and talk a little bit about some of this stuff. But before I do, uh, I, I think it is nice to sort of set the stage with a quote, which I'm sure everybody knows who this guy is, Kevin Mennick, and, and love him or hate him. And believe me, there are definitely strong opinions on both sides. <laughs> uh, you know, this guy did a lot of this, and, and some of his stories are, in fact, really good ones in their own right. Because what he found is that people are fairly predictable, and he could leverage that predictability in many different ways once he understood the patterns of behavior that people tend to exhibit to accomplish his own goals. Now, many of those goals were, of course, somewhat illicit, and that's where the opinions come in. But, but what he found was that social engineering, using persuasion, using influence, uh, was really a valuable tool in his toolkit that allowed him to accomplish a number of the things that he wanted to do. And what I think of when I look at a quote like this is more, how can we sort of turn this into a process? How can we leverage all these things we've seen for decades now kind of predictably happening to people 
and turn them to, as Lance said, helping better defend our people and our organizations. So uh, um, I'll start off with a little bit of psychology. And as, as Lance was saying, my, my goal here isn't really to just blab at you guys about these principles and so forth, but, but really to kind of illustrate this with some examples from my own practice and from also having seen organizations improve and, and sort of get, uh, you know, get this under their belt. Um, Robert Caldini is probably best known in the world of psychology as the guy that, that really discovered and, and documented some of the most pervasive persuasion principles out there. And in fact, you'll find his work is often cited in sales seminars and really any type of industry or vertical that potentially needs people to be able to convince other people to do something or to act in a certain way. And, and so he studied this for years and years and years. And really this is sort of at the heart of why social engineering is in fact effective. So I'll start off with these because this is what I always introduce into any of the teams that I'm working with for performing social engineering and likewise the classes that we teach that go into this as well. So number one, uh, this is the principle of reciprocation. And this is a real simple one in many cases because what you realize is people have this sort of built-in tendency to hold a small nug uh, nugget of debt. Right? And, and I know that sounds weird, but what that means is that if somebody does something nice for us or if somebody does a favor for us or if somebody gives us something, we sort of hold on to this little notch of, hey, I got to do something back. Now, granted, there are some sociopaths out there that just don't have this. <laughs> and you're going to run into them once in a while. But most average folks genuinely are pretty good people, and they tend to exhibit this principle readily. One I we see, for instance, if you're going into an office building, and I've used this one to my, you know to my own effect numerous times, is that if you hold, uh, if you have like double doors going into a building, um, people will often uh, either hold one for you or the other one for you if you hold one first. And so this is actually a great tactic, and it's an extremely simple one. If you have a, uh, the case of a building where there's an external door that a number of people are coming into at the same time, and that one's not locked or sort of protected in any way, but the internal door requires maybe a badge or something else. If, uh, if you hold the first one and sort of come through in a herd, somebody else will almost invariably, whether badge access is required or not, hold the second one for you. And, and this is just the nature of how human beings tend to respond. You know, hey, you did this little favor for me. Now I'm going to do the same thing for you. Uh, I also use this extensively as part of a, a play on ego. And so, in fact, in some of my most successful spear phishing campaigns, particularly for executives, and for those of you that may be tuned in here that fall into the executive ranks, don't take this as an affront, but uh, executives do have egos. They're typically successful. They've worked their way up the chain. Uh, and they like to be acknowledged for things. And it's just the way that that tends to play out. And so if I do a little bit of recon on uh, you know, organizations and their executives, it's not that tough to occasionally find some attributes of those people that can be used as part of a spear phishing campaign. So let me give you an example of this. Uh, one of the pen tests I did about three years ago specifically focused on a handful of executives, one of whom was their chief financial officer. And this chief financial officer uh, was not a difficult guy to actually find information about. So he had lots of public information um, kind of out there. Social media was, uh, you know, was out there, and I was able to sort of find out some things about this guy. And what I realized is that he was an extremely avid golfer and, uh, and you know, had appeared at a number of different golf tournaments. In fact, there were pictures of him sort of posing with some, you know, reasonably famous professional golfers and, and so forth. And so uh, I crafted a spear phishing campaign specifically for this individual that purported to come from a charitable organization hosting a golf tournament and asking for this executive to appear as sort of a special guest and, and represent the organization. And so my spear phishing campaign, and, and again, this was a completely customized email and we put together a whole site uh, around this, just simply asked for him to acknowledge his participation and uh, you know, go to the site that we had set up for him to, to do so, and you know, it was a, an immediate success. And so we were able to you know, really end up compromising this organization significantly using that as an initial avenue. But it all came down to the fact that, you know, hey, 
uh, you know, you've obviously given a lot to the golfing community and so on and so on. Now you can, you know, kind of come back and, and, you know, give us this, uh, you know, participation. And so it was sort of a reciprocation play there. You guys have probably heard of some of the more famous ones out there, like, um, you know, the chocolate for passwords experiment of years past, where people at a train station were given, uh, you know, great chocolates in return for their enterprise passwords. And whether those passwords were legitimate or not sort of doesn't matter. It's the fact that a pretty good piece of chocolate was deemed enough <laughs> to give up credentials, and, and I think that holds water even today. Um, even the classic Nigerian prince, right? I mean, that's the whole principle. Now, you laugh and go, well, there's no way I'd be clicking on this Nigerian prince campaign, Dave. But you know what? Somebody is, and uh, it's obviously still floating around out there, so there's someone who truly believes, you know, if I just help this nice Nigerian gentleman, I'm going to get a bunch of money for it. Once again, reciprocation. Uh, the second one is social proof. Social proof is really pretty easy, too. It's all about uh, sort of looking around us and allowing others' actions and behaviors and sort of how the social norms, as it were, occur within an organization um, that, you know, that, that maybe gets you where you need to go. And, and the, the easy one here is smoking. So smokers have sort of their own code, right, especially when they all tend to go outside at the same time and smoke during specific you know, periods, maybe before lunch or what have you. Um, I'm not a smoker, which is why I will tell you the introduction of these uh, sort of vape pens is a lifesaver for me as a pen tester because I can blend in without actually having to smoke, so it's awesome for me. But the whole thing is people exhibit these same behaviors, and I have found numerous cases, even though it's almost a cliche today in the world of social engineering and awareness and pen testing, that you know somebody's going to hold the door for you as a smoker. It, in fact, is absolutely true. And I've used this exact technique in probably six, seven different pen tests over the course of the last 18 months to have people allow me into facilities because I was there and I was smoking and we were hanging out and you know I had learned enough to sort of blend in and have conversation. And the same thing goes for you know either installing apps that others are using or sort of wanting to do the same things that others are doing to fit in a little bit. Um, so social proof, again, you have to know a little bit more before you go into that, but it's another really effective one. Um, commitment and consistency, this one's easy. Uh, this is the fact that people like patterns in their lives. Um, I, I think you know people are busy today. People tend to get a lot of things on their plate, and they want to compartmentalize certain parts of their life to where they don't have to think about them that much, so they develop routines. And I always joke about this where I, I ask people in my classes, uh, you know, and I'll say, hey, when you guys drove to work uh, last week, you know, something like this, did you, trend to, did you find a parking space that you particularly like to park in? Now, you may not have your name on it, but it's probably that place that you like to park. And if somebody else is in your parking space when you pull up in the morning, you're probably a little ticked off about it, whether it's your defined parking space or not. And usually that's, in fact, very true. People tend to go to lunch at the same time. People tend to go to the same places for lunch. People tend to have these sort of consistent and predictable behaviors. You can manipulate that as a pen tester. And so a lot of the time when I go and, and sort of case an organization, particularly physically, I will actually observe when people leave for lunch. I'll take a look at sort of where they go. I'll look at the, which doors or you know, kind of exits they come out of. And I will learn those patterns so that I can try to then either come in at a specific time or leave with those people at a specific time. You know, those kinds of things tend to be very helpful as a pen tester. This can also be used as a longer term influence. So Kevin Mitnick was pretty good about this. In fact, if you've read any of his stories, what, what he would do, and I've actually sort of stolen this from having read some of Kevin's stories, is I will plan a longer term campaign of pretexting or social engineering over the phone by calling up and, and essentially just becoming known to someone and becoming known as my persona. And so I'll get into some of the more specific tactics in just a bit here. But I don't try to go for the gusto immediately. So if I know that I'm trying to compromise somebody at a help desk or within a particular part of the organization, what I'll usually do is come up with a premise and get them to recognize me, maybe by calling consistently. So calling up you know, once every day for a few days or, you know, calling back in a week and saying I'm going to call back in a week and check on something. Just basically small innocuous requests that build on one another 
that allows a rapport to be built, but because I'm building consistency into the relationship, even though it's a completely farcical relationship, people tend to get much more comfortable with me. So when I eventually ask for something more meaningful, it's as though they know me or they at least feel like I'm not some complete stranger. And this is a very successful tactic, but it takes a lot more planning. And I've used this, you know, again, many times successfully to come in and sort of introduce myself. And in fact, I've posed as sort of like a, you know, vendor software representative calling the help desk and saying, hey, we're planning some upgrades in two weeks. Uh, I'm going to need some information. I'm coordinating with this person and this person. And I'll call back next week with some more information and sort of, con you know, confirm things. And basically what you do is you build this campaign over time. And it works pretty well. Uh, people like people like themselves. I think everybody gets that. So if you can find a way to mimic people's behavior, um, this is really useful in person. So if you're good at listening and sort of nodding and smiling at the right places and really listening to what people are saying or doing, um, you can bounce it back at those people and they'll tend to like you more. This is used very effectively by salespeople, but I think most people genuinely get this. I mean, um, if, if somebody tends to have the same hobbies or the same interests or the same general characteristics, whether it's related to your organization or not, they're going to be more favorable towards you overall. Um, the principle of authority is a little bit harder to pull off, and it depends in some cases on culture. So you'll find that if you call up somebody at your typical American company and just sort of beat them over the head with authority saying, hey, I'm, you know, a special snowflake and I need something because your boss told me to do this, people will sort of bristle and won't necessarily cooperate as well as if you try to coerce them in a kinder way or a little bit more, um, you know, subtly manipulative way. Whereas in certain Asian countries, where there is a very specific hierarchy or kind of chain of command that's understood and not questioned necessarily, if you know what you're doing and you can call up those, you know, those specific people and play that authority figure or speak to that, you may have a higher degree of success. And I, I certainly don't want to suggest that that's across the board because it isn't, but you have to understand a little bit about how you're bringing in the authority figure or playing that authoritative role. In a simpler way, um, just dressing the part or looking really successful tends to be helpful. So on the average, I'm a pretty casual guy. You know, I'm a jeans, you know, t-shirt or button-down kind of guy, you know, typically, um, you know, much more business casual on the whole. But if I'm really trying to make that immediate first impression as a social engineer and, and walk into a building and have people go, wow, this guy, you know, obviously is, is whoever he says he is. Um, I'm going to go above and beyond that by far. So I'm going to wear a suit. I'm gonna, I might, you know, be significantly more flashy than I really am uh, to make myself look successful, or to make myself look as though I'm somebody that that sort of the backstory supports. Um, and that takes a little bit of planning as well. But that idea of authority or, or sort of the surrounding pieces of that uh, sort of hold water. Um, and the last one that came from Caldini is scarcity. And I use this one all the time. In fact, uh, I did this um, about eight months ago. I did a phishing campaign. And, and you're going to laugh at this one because it seems so ridiculous. But I was working with a client. And we were, I mean, to be honest, we were sort of experimenting. <laughs> we were playing around. We did probably 30 different unique you know, kind of types of, of emails and, and approaches just to sort of play and see what might work. And one of the ones we did uh, basically created a, a, a simple framework of new Apple products that you can get a hold of before Apple formally releases them if you join this program. And anybody that has Apple products knows there's no way you're getting a hold of Apple products before their formal launch date and release date. And so it's, it's, it's just laughable if you sort of are in the know. But the particular user group we sent this to this was an incredibly uh, compelling argument, apparently, because we had about an 85% click rate on these emails that were offering them early access to Apple products. And it all came down to the principle of scarcity. You can get something before somebody else has it and sort of subtly gloat about the fact that you have it and they don't. And we all sort of, laugh. you know, it's, it's like a childish principle, but it works. And so we had really great success by coming up with a phishing email that, uh, you know, sort of pretended to give them something that, that nobody else could have if they were, if they were uh, a part of it. So 
all of those cases are, are great. These are things, again, that I really teach social engineers or budding social engineers to, to embrace and, and bring into all of the different cases that they have. I'll leave you guys with this on the psychological side, and then we'll be done with that. But if you haven't read this book by Chris Hadnagy, who I just think is a brilliant guy and, and certainly stands out as one of the, the leaders in this field, he's got a couple specific goals that I bring in, too, uh, for any social engineer or any pen tester. And, and I think if you're on the defensive side, you can look for these kind of principles yourselves and people that might be trying to do you harm. Um, you know, any good social engineer is going to have a goal. They're not going to just, you know, charge in and hope for the best. They're going to want something. Uh, they're ideally going to build rapport with someone. So, for instance, if you're trying to train your help desk teams or the, you know, sort of support teams that are number one targets for these folks, if there's anybody unusual like me, just calling in routinely and, and, and trying to kind of chat it up, be suspicious. There's no harm in being suspicious, right? Get callback numbers. Verify things before you go anywhere in, in terms of conversation. Don't give away any personal information. I mean, all these things make great sense, but people still violate them all the time. Um, any pen testers that I'm training, I'll tell, hey, make sure you're aware of your surroundings, um, down to how people are dressing, how they're behaving. Uh, you know, be flexible, so don't just, you know, try to barge your way through the front door if that's not the right approach. Find, you know, other avenues. Um, and the last one he gives, which I really like, and I, I think this speaks directly to the human factor, is to understand how you behave and really what your strengths and weaknesses are, particularly as a social engineer. And, and I think good social engineers are absolutely critical, uh, you know, in, in doing this. You have to know yourself. So I tend to be a fairly excitable guy, and Lance is probably laughing right now because he's been around me for years. And I am an excitable guy, and I tend to sort of jump around and have entirely too much energy for my own good. And by the way, so does Lance. Um, so when I go into an environment where I need to perhaps be a little more calm and, uh, you know, I, I can't be all, you know, kind of crazy Dave, I need to know that about myself. And so I have to understand that in a pressure situation or in a stressful situation, my normal reaction is to sort of, you know, exhibit too much energy. That's not good. So I have to purposefully tell myself to calm down. And again, th this is all about just how to behave so that you can blend in the most effectively. So there's, there's a whole bunch of ways to use these principles. But really, they come into sort of the tactics and tools and things that we're going to talk about now um, and, and really what it all comes down to. So um, this, this is basically the, the stuff that I teach people how to do. And, and, and I laugh when I do this. Because as my you know, pen testing career has taken off over the years and teaching classes in pen testing, I just kick myself once in a while and go, how the heck does anybody get this job? Like, it's a weird job, you know? you know? What do you do for a living? Well, I basically lie, cheat, and steal, and people pay me to do it, and that's just a, a strange place to be in your life. Uh, but that is exactly what we're all about doing here. We are looking for ways to elicit data from, you know, solicit uh, information from people or get information uh, that is useful later or even compromise people directly. And there's huge variance on, on how to go about this. So I'm going to jump in and, and give you guys sort of some of my takes on this stuff and, and, and what it comes down to um, in terms of phishing as a starting point. So phishing, I think, is the, the most practically useful way to social engineer people. Um, and it's probably, for any of you guys fighting the good fight, either trying to teach people or protect their endpoints and, and systems or both. Um, phishing is just sort of this pervasive issue we know we're going to be wrangling forever. So email is not going away as a communication vector, and attackers know this, and thus phishing. So when I look at emails that are most successful and targeting people for, for phishing campaigns, typically, as, as a you know, on the whole, well-written and, and legit-looking content makes sense. Let me give you an example, however, where it didn't. And so this was something that I coordinated fairly carefully with the client I was working with. Uh, and this was about two years ago, so this was uh, you know, a while back. But there was a, um, a specific case that I was trying to emulate as part of a phishing campaign from a director within the IT organization who was notorious for incredibly bad grammar and spelling. And so I was, in fact, trying to create uh, sort of a directive that went out to a select group of administrators and support team personnel 
that needed to look as though it came from this individual, and he just was terrible, apparently. I mean, so much so that people just made fun of him all the time and, and you know, was sort of the butt of jokes. So my normal approach in that case as a pen tester, had I crafted this beautiful Shakespearean, you know, eloquent email that went out, might have actually been more suspicious and triggered some questions than knowing what I was up against and creating something that purposefully had misspellings and other issues within them. Now, if I'm creating a generic phishing campaign that's just trying to get past the spam filters and, and sort of look like something that you want people to click on, that's not normally the approach you're going to take. You are going to write something legit. You're going to make it look like it comes from company X, whatever it is. Um, ideally, it's going to have a direct relationship to a target. So you don't want to send somebody some completely random thing that they just go, huh, what is this? The absolute most effective things in the world of phishing tend to be things that people feel a sense of urgency or importance around. And that could be a personal sense of urgency or importance or one related to work. Then sometimes those are sort of combined or concatenated. But usually it's something that they feel, hey, I got to do something about this. You know, I got to actually respond to this or I've got to do something. And great examples abound here. I mean, things like uh, needing to update their health insurance information, needing to update their 401k, needing to uh, respond for some corporate initiative that is going to be tracked. So there's the subtle implication of, uh, you know, potential ramifications to them if they don't do something about it. Like, hey, we're tracking everybody that's gone and done it. Uh, why haven't you done it sort of idea? And that, that really works. You know, it's not a threat, but it's an implied threat that if they don't do it, they're going to get in trouble or they're at least going to have more issues. So usually creating something that's well written and, and so forth is a good idea. But, but like I said, uh, I had one case where it did not. And we were, again, spectacularly successful because people thought this was, you know, this was something that came directly from them. Um, these are all just examples that I usually give when I talk about phishing, and some of these are, you know, they're obviously going to be familiar to you guys. I mean, pay, the PayPal stuff is just like, okay. I mean, how many people deal with PayPal? Probably a lot. Same thing with Amazon. In fact, uh, you know, on the average, I don't, you know, all of you guys that are listening in today, how many of you currently are expecting a notification from, a, you know, Amazon in terms of a delivery or, or some order update? It's probably pretty high. And that number, you know, it escalates extraordinarily as soon as you get close to the holidays. And this is a great tactic for people that really want to test people's awareness, get close to the Christmas holidays or other sorts of holidays, and then send a well-designed and crafted Amazon shipping update or Amazon order update email. And people will often just blindly click these things. I mean, it's, it, it's almost insidious in how common it is. But, hey, that's what we're here for. Um, so these are examples that I like, and, and probably my favorite one out of this, this is a great targeted example, is the one from the AICPA. For those of you that aren't familiar with the AICPA, I mean, this is kind of the accrediting body for people that do accounting work, and it's a big deal if the AICPA accuses you of an ethics violation, because you could use, uh, lose your license to perform your, your you know, livelihood. Uh, and so people will often click on this, if it's, you know, again, well-designed and it's an accountant you're sending it to, um, you know, the same could be said for security professionals. In fact, uh, I, I mimicked this when I stole this one uh, about six months ago and sent it to a security team looking like it came from ISC squared, threatening to revoke their CISSPs, uh, and had an extraordinarily strong hit rate because people said, wow, you know, I, I could be accused of an ethics violation uh, and lose this you know, sort of certification that I had, and, and people freaked out about this. And again, is it, is it a little bit evil? Yeah, absolutely. But that's, you know, that's again what it comes down to. So phishing is definitely one that, that I tend to do just constantly, and I'm sure you guys are all sort of struggling with. Um, pretexting is like a nice word for lying to people. Um, you know, pretexting, I guess, sounds better than lying, so we use that. But pretexting is all about calling people up on the phone I'm trying to get them to do things, and, and so I've done a ton of this uh, over the course of my career, and, and, and there's just so many interesting little subtle psychological factors that, that come into this because people tend to respond to verbal communications really differently than they do something like an email, which by its own nature is somewhat impersonal. So calling people on the phone 
you better have your game on as a pen tester. And, and so I tend to really know what I'm going to say and, and what I you know, kind of coach people in our classes to do is anticipate failure. So when you ask for something or when you try to direct a conversation in a specific way, have an answer to things that are going to come back as failure scenarios. So if you ask for something and they go, hey, who are you again? Well, make sure you have a good backup story. Make sure you can corroborate things. Make sure you have all your facts written down in front of you. Um, you know, these are all good things to do when you're calling people. But there are some tips and tricks here. Um, some of you guys probably know this, but female voices tend to be just universally more successful at pretexting than, than male voices. Um, and so obviously I don't have a female voice, but I do have female accomplices, and that helps me out tremendously, especially in certain circumstances. So like the gender actually matters in terms of just calling people sort of randomly out of the blue and trying to entice them to do things. Um, finding people's numbers is not hard. Very often I'm given those as part of my engagements, but if I don't uh, you know, have those in front of me, I can go usually at least track down a few of them. Um, and what you'll often also find is that people today are a bit more suspicious unless there's a um, sort of emotional tie-in to the call. Great example of this, in fact, I can't claim that, that this was mine, but a great example of this was actually done last year at the DEF CON conference and demonstrated for a journalist where, um, you know, again, they were, they were sort of trying to find out about social engineering. Some of you guys might have seen this one, but it's just so fantastic. Uh, and in fact, it was uh, a nice young lady that works with Chris Hadnagy who was doing the demonstration. And he said, hey, so try to call my mobile number or, or you know, company and get a bunch of information about my account. And so she did. She posed as his wife, called up the uh, cellular company, and what she did was played the sound of a screaming baby in the background. So she just looked up a screaming baby you know, sound clip, started it in the background, and sounded successfully like a very harried mother, a young mother, who's trying to juggle these you know, motherly duties with, a, with an upset child and has also been tasked by her husband with calling up this company and getting this information. And she just hit it out of the park because she got a female uh, tech support person who immediately identified with the fact that she was a young mother and felt incredibly sorry for her. And you could hear it in her voice, actually, coming through. She felt terribly sorry for this woman who was just trying to get her baby fed and had to do this for the husband and gave up everything. I mean, you know, long story short, it was a very quick affair <laughs> for, for her to successfully prove just how calling somebody on the phone and having a story around it is successful. So, so you know, I've done a lot of this. In fact, I'll tell you a, a quick story of my own. Um, one of the things that I try to do if I'm targeting help desks for global companies um, is, or, or you know, at least for larger companies, I'll look at when their third shift support would be. Very few organizations today staff their own third shift in-house support teams. Usually they'll outsource it during third shift. So I'll find out where the headquarters is and typically say, okay, if it's, you know, an East Coast company, um, you know, I'm going to try to call them purposefully when it's outsourced because those people, they're not your employees. So they've been given a script they're supposed to just do a thing during those hours, but they, you know, they don't work directly for you. They're just part of a, like a contract. And so I tend to have a higher degree of success, particularly with help desk organizations in those hours. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was doing a test for um, a very large international law firm that was based out of Boston in the United States. And uh, just coincidentally, during some of the time that I was doing the testing, I was traveling in Europe for other clients and doing some work, and uh, my wife actually came over and met me, and uh, we were going to spend a few days. We were in Prague, actually. But Prague, and some of you might know, of course, just off the top of your head, is six hours different from the east coast of the U.S., and so I sort of just lucked into this situation where it was a Friday, and my wife and I were going to go spend the weekend in Prague and sort of hang out, and I said, well, hey, I, you know, I, I got to knock out some stuff for a client really quick first thing in the morning, and so we got up early at, at like, you know, I think it was seven o'clock in the morning in Prague. And uh, I basically called in to their help desk first thing in the morning in Prague, but it was the middle of the night in Boston or on the East Coast, and they, sure enough, had outsourced their entire help desk. And, uh, and so I'm sitting there in our hotel room, and basically I just went online. I found uh, the name of one of their senior partners that 
specialized in international law, and I pretended to be this guy and, and basically called in and, and acted a little irate like I was traveling in Europe for a client, and I was going to a meeting, and I couldn't get into my email, and um, sure enough, you know, it, it, it worked, and they reset my password, and I could have gone and completely owned every bit of this, you know, fairly high-ranking attorney's uh, information within about a four-minute phone call. My, and, and the reason I even brought my wife into this is because she was sitting there uh, in our hotel room, you know, drinking a cup of coffee, just listening to me lie to these people on the phone. And, and you know, at the end of the call, she goes, you know, people actually pay you to do this? It was sort of a comic moment. But once again, it was all just knowing how organizations tend to work. Um, tailgating is an easy one. You're just trying to get into a, you know, facility. And so this is more physical social engineering, but this one's incredibly nuanced in the sense that you, you kind of do need to know how people look and how people act, and that includes things like dress code and mannerisms and, and behaviors that people are exhibiting as part of an organization. So if I go to a, a bank and I'm wearing, you know, khakis and a, and a, you know, and a golf shirt, I'm probably going to be underdressed, whereas if I go to uh, Silicon Valley in a software shop, and I'm wearing a suit, they're going to wonder what I'm trying to sell them. So you need to know the target organization and, and sort of play that role going in. But getting in via tailgating uh, is often not hard. And, and in fact, um, a lady that did some work for me, she's since retired, but uh, I, I often refer to her in some of my stories. She's, um, she was just an amazing, amazing woman in many ways, but she was the most effective at tailgating that I'd ever seen in my life. She was about mid-50s. Um, you know, basically, if you if you close your eyes and just envision what a grandma looks like, right? Envision grandmother, like kindly grandma. She was grandma, and so she and she could get in anywhere, and she basically could sweet talk her way through guards. She had the fake badge that didn't work, and it was just a bad day for her, and you know, and everything. And she would just get in places and then start owning stuff left and right, and you know, taking screenshots of sensitive documents. I mean, she was just awesome. Her name was Jocelyn, but. Um, she was just a master at this. She always looked apart. She was just incredibly friendly. Everybody just like naturally warmed up to her. And so to, to some degree, uh, tailgating really does kind of come down to the person. You know, if you're one of those people that people just naturally trust and sort of warm up to, then you're going to be more successful with that. Uh, the last one here is media drops. And so media drops, of course, we used to drop things like, you know, DVDs or CDs, and now that's just impractical for a million reasons. And so today it tends to be USBs that we drop. Um, and most of the time what you're going to do is you're going to pre-configure these with some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of a payload or something that indicates that it was plugged in and, and used uh, in an illicit fashion. And so there's a couple key things to this. I mean, really, I've, I've learned a few lessons over the years, and I'm sure you guys have all heard the classic USB in the parking lot story. Well, guess what? Uh, USBs in the parking lot are actually incredibly ineffective because it turns out people run over them or miss them and aren't paying attention. So I don't tend to really drop a lot in the parking lot. I do tend to actually put labels on these. And so this one, while it seems ridiculous, right, salary data, seriously, who's going to pick that up? Turns out a ton of people will pick that up, but this is where you get to have some fun as a pen tester is coming up with creative labels and things that will entice people. And I've done a million of these, different experiments around these, but the one I found a couple years ago that works almost across the board at any normal organization is by putting a label on there that says uh, either layoff plan or force reduction. Um, everybody's worried about getting laid off. And so again, there's the evil coming back in here. Um, you know, people will definitely check to see if they are in the list of folks to be laid off. So I, I, if you ever hear about something like this, you should go to high alert because no HR department, uh, you know, on, on the planet is going to actually have something like that laying about, I would imagine. But people don't know that, and they're easily tricked into plugging stuff like this in. Uh, a couple other things I tend to find is, um, you know, you can't drop too many of these. So organizations are getting more savvy about this. I mean, if you find hundreds of USBs just automatically showing up at a facility, that is super weird. Uh, so you can't just go scattering these things everywhere. You, you've got to be a little bit more sort of close-knit about them. Um, best place to drop this stuff is actually like a lobby waiting area. If you've got some chairs or, or sort of you know couches that people sit in, visitors that are coming in, those are great places. While it sounds a little bit gross, 
uh, restroom facilities that are publicly available, like in a lobby area. I'm not suggesting you put them uh, by or near the toilets themselves, but often you'll find that there's a sink area with maybe a little, um, you know, sort of countertop or some place where people can set something while they're washing their hands. And if you put those things there, people will pick them up all day long. It's crazy. I don't know what, what it is, but people will definitely get them there as well. Um, and uh, the last point I'll make is that, uh, you know, th they usually have to be at least two gigs or, or greater in size. Like if it's, if it's less than two gigs, People won't even bother with it, right? So you have to you have to actually sort of you know couch this today, just given that storage is so cheap. Most people don't uh, don't even bother with things that are that are less than that, you know. And that, and that's sort of a joke, but not always. Uh, other ways that I've varied these, I mean, there's all sorts of great great sort of variations on this, but um, you know, I'll, I'll sort of keep it short. I'll just tell you guys a, a great example from my own uh, experience, right? So I, I actually had to come up with some creative ways to try to trick people above and beyond like a traditional fish or, or something else. So what I did was come up with uh, the idea of, of a particular client of mine, and this was, you know, again, a couple years ago where I did this one, but it's still a great story because uh, they said, look, you know, we, we want to try to find something unique here. And so what I did was um, I, I printed up flyers that advertised a company picnic, and I went into their parking deck and put it under a bunch of people's windshields. And so what I did is I created a fake site that basically people would go to and they would register to come to the company picnic and tell what they were going to bring. And, and so, you know, you have to ask yourself, hey, you know, what kind of company picnic registration site would actually require people's active directory, username, and credentials? Um, and the answer is none, reasonably, but uh, I had about a 90% hit rate across this one, um, which... You know, I think it, I think I distributed it to you know 500 cars or so. So that's a pretty solid hit, and people came to this and said, "Yeah, I'm bringing fried chicken or you know whatever it was," but they entered their credentials in order to do so, and the whole thing was done via flyer. So um, the, the thought that you can hack somebody via flyer sounds a little bit crazy, but nonetheless, it's possible. So just examples of things that have worked well for me over the years, and uh, you got to be on the lookout for things ab above and beyond the normal methods. I'll throw in a few tools here real quick. Um, you know, I won't spend too much time on any one of these necessarily, but these are just things that I tend to use. Uh, I use Google and, and other search engines for recon and, and looking stuff up all the time. The, the, the downside to this as a defender is that there's just not really much you can do about it other than doing it yourself and trying to find stuff that's been published that shouldn't be that might violate policy or just you know, sort of be a bad idea and then you know, incorporate that into your education campaigns. Um, I use Multigo, which is probably my favorite tool on the planet for finding just about everything because it just goes and looks up data about organizations and people and then links it to more uh, organization info or people info, and it just sort of keeps going and builds these maps. Um, a tool by Robin Wood called Cool is really good for spidering websites and, and grabbing specific keywords and things, but it's really sort of a helper tool. If you've never seen Multigo, this is a really basic example. Man, I can't remember you know, what screenshot I grabbed this from, but you know, essentially uh, you know, what you can do is, is sort of provide it with a piece of information and then keep using um, Multigo and its online sort of engine to find other data that's related to that. And then whatever data you find, you can find other things related to that. And you can build this massive tree of information. And it's used, in fact, by um, you know, private investigators and all sorts of different types of professionals to, to really just build information maps about organizations and people, and so it tends to be very, very useful. Um, and I recommend the defense side use this too, because you'll find stuff out there about you and your organization and your people that probably nobody even knew was out there, and it's just very, very good at finding that kind of stuff. Um, this is just an example of using cool, and this is, you know, I won't spend a bunch of time here, but basically it just goes and spiders through a site and pulls back a bunch of data and then sorts it out into a keyword file, which I'll tell you, if you do this against your site, you're going to find some incredibly common keywords that are related to, say, products that you sell or people's names or locations or other things that really tend to be common in people's password generation schemes. And so if you're trying to have a, an education or awareness campaign around passwords specifically and what not to do, Go do this, run it against your own sites, 
and then dig out some of the more interesting keywords and suggest that people not use those <laughs> as part of their passwords. And I guarantee you some people do uh, because I get them all the time. So other stuff you can do, um, pretexting tools. This is one of my also you know, favorite tools in addition to like Multigo. Um, the spoof card app on your phone is just a voice over IP proxy, which means I can dial phone numbers through it and uh, it can spoof the number, which is great, so I can look like I'm coming from an internal connection or something else. But what's really insidious about this app is that it incorporates a bunch of different sound effects in the background right there in the app. So it's got one for like office sounds that sounds like phones ringing in the background and people chatting. It's got one for uh, like traffic so you can sound like you're outside. It's got another one for like a cocktail party if you were trying to make it sound like you were calling somebody from a party or something. So you can just click a button in the app while you're on the phone and add in these background noises that lend credence to whatever your pretexting story is. You can also record the calls. Of course, you've got to be careful with that just because it could violate the law uh, for things like wiretapping and so on. But it's just an amazing app. And it's sort of purpose built to help people do social engineering activities. So I'm a big fan of that. You could build your own with asterisk, but that's a lot of work. Uh, other multi-purpose tools, of course, Metasploit, which I use to build a lot of the um, sort of payloads that I drop on USBs. Uh, if I get into facilities dropping in uh, like Pony Express boxes or things that look like a, you know, like a power supply that obviously aren't a power supply, they're actually some insidious drop box with a bunch of, uh, you know, sort of callback mechanisms and, and so on. I mean, there's a lot of tools that you can build. I mean, this goes further into things like red team testing and on-premise engagements for social engineering. Uh, by and large, there's a whole discipline around that that needs to be incorporated into people's just awareness of their surroundings. But um, you know that's getting pretty specialized. The last one here is the social engineering toolkit, which is uh, a tool written by my friend Dave Kennedy and, and his uh, company, Trusted Sec. And um, it's, it's used extensively by pen testers and, and probably will continue to be forever as long as he maintains it because it's just, it sort of simplifies things like creating phishing emails and even payloads and other things. And this is just an example of using tools like Metasploit. And uh, what you see here on the left is the Pony Express sort of power adapter that's really an evil, uh, you know, sort of callback mechanism. And, and we do, we drop these kinds of things in people's environments all the time. And, and there's a whole bunch of different ways to do this stuff. So I'll wrap us up here, sort of get towards the end. You know, what's the point of all this stuff? We, we've basically got to test our security awareness programs. And so the way I always treat social engineering pen tests is as a legitimate test of controls. Um, I look at security awareness as a control. It's a, it's a hard fight, <laughs> but it's one that most organizations are investing in and, in fact, investing more in and the only real way we're going to get better at this is if we emulate what the attackers are doing. And so I really like to see people doing more of it and, and sort of training their teams up uh, to, to recognize these behaviors and, and sort of improve upon this um, over time. And, and I'll tell you guys, most of the time when I produce reports around this, it, it doesn't go so far as to shame people, right? So I, in fact, most of these types of reports I've published I tend to give two versions of, one which has people's names and that's used specifically for helping re-educate, and then another maybe more generic one that just lists the total number of people that were susceptible or something else. Uh, because you do need to know where the problems are. And um, you know, obviously doing pen tests that incorporate this, these techniques can be helpful. I, I tend to think it's also a pretty fun uh, set of activities, but um, <laughs> you know, that's just me as the, uh, you know, as, as the pen tester and, and just as um, Lance said at the beginning here, we do have a two-day class on this at SANS called Security 567, Social Engineering for Pen Testers, and it is a heck of a lot of fun. So I will stop there, hand it back off to the folks at SANS in case anyone's got any questions. All right, thanks for that great presentation. We have some questions ready for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for Dave or Lance, please enter it into the questions window now. Our first question is for Dave. Uh, Dan would like to know, did your wife ever believe you after the prog call? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's a totally fair question, given that story. She knows I tell this story, by the way, too. And, uh, no, she, she definitely believes me. I mean, she knows that, um, yes, I do, in fact, get paid to, to lie for a living. But, 
Um, I'm not really a liar by nature. I just come up with good stories. And so, yeah, I mean, this is our 20-year anniversary about a month ago. So I must be doing something right, or maybe I'm just getting better at, at uh, coming up with these stories. I don't know. Good question. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dave. Um, let's see here. I've heard that phishing pen tests can backfire, causing the employees to feel they are not trusted and that they are being tricked. Can you comment on this? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one um, because it sort of gets into the political landscape of cultures and the organizations themselves. And sometimes it's also tied into, you know, for instance, I mean, depending on the nature of the phishing campaign, even things like local privacy laws and regulations, particularly in Europe. So you, you do have to be careful about this. And I, I think what I found to be most successful in doing a phishing campaign is to treat it as sort of a what I call a, a phishing light campaign. Um, and, and, you know, again, I, I think um, to, to me, am I going to compromise somebody's system and, and, you know, like make a big deal out of it? No, no, no. But maybe understanding that somebody clicked on something uh, especially if they've been educated on this, if, if all we do is sort of count the click and then make a note that, hey, you know, just be more careful about clicking, it tends to not be quite as, you know, dramatic or serious as, hey, somebody compromised your system and took over the whole network and it's all your fault, you were the, in, you know, a major ingress point, et cetera. So th there's, there's grades of this stuff, but, but Lance probably has a good answer to this one too. Yeah, one of the things we've seen really work well is, first of all, the biggest difference between pen testing a computer and pen testing a human is people have emotions. We have to keep that in mind. So the one thing I've seen work really well, and it's not so much for pen testing, but if you're going to set up a phishing program, say, for example, you fish everyone once a month, start with your first fish to be actually your easiest or your simplest fish, as opposed to starting off with, really targeted so you get everyone. Because if you start with really targeted, well, then you do get everyone. And they feel like they've been tricked and taken advantage of, building resentment. So what we found consistently works really well. Start actually with your simplest phishing email, the most basic one, the one that theoretically nobody should fall for, you know, the Nigerian scam, the British lottery, whatever. And if it's your very first fish in an untrained organization, you'll still have 20, 30% fall victim. But instead of them resenting it, they'll be like, oh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have clicked on that. And then over time, you can get more difficult, but as people get trained. So I always like to start softly, start gently, let them know we're here to train and learn and ultimately help. Then you find the buy-in far more effective. Okay, thank you. Knowing that humans are often the weakest link in the security chain, <laughs> can stupid be fixed? Put another way, are there some who simply cannot be trained? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, Dave, if you don't mind, I'll take this one. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I've been in cybersecurity for over 20 years. First half of my, that career was highly technical. Unix, firewalls, pen testing, honeypots, cyber intel, all over the map. Past 10 years has been on the human side. And so I can understand both the technical perspective and the human perspective. And I'll be honest, nowadays I get very frustrated when I hear our community say, you can't patch stupid. To any security professional that says, we can't patch stupid, I'm going to ask you to take a long look in the mirror. Because the people we're trying to help and secure are people like doctors, lawyers, engineers, accountants, researchers, scientists. These are all very intelligent people that want to do the right thing. Quite often, I tend to find the failure being not that they're wrong, but we in the security community have done a poor job of making security simple for them and communicating in a way that they can understand. I mean, passwords. We make, pass we make fun of people for not having good passwords, but think about it. What are we telling them? It must be so many characters, capital letters, I mean, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, letters, symbols, no consecutive numbers or letters, stir in the blood of a virgin, and then go ahead and change it every 90 days. So first of all, can we secure people? Absolutely. We just have to make it simpler 
and communicate in their terms. Now, there is always, though, a small percentage that you will not be able to change behavior. We can't get everybody to wear seat belts. You're not going to get everybody to use good passwords. So you have to be prepared. What are you going to do with those people who don't change behavior? Every organization will be different. How defense organization, like a Lockheed Martin handles that, would be very different than, say, a university like Michigan Tech. But you're going to have to be prepared for some people not changing behavior. All done. OK, thank you. We have several questions that are kind of related. Uh, one person asks, what is the best way to get into the pen testing field? And somebody says, where does somebody go to look for jobs in pen testing? And another person, how, benefic how beneficial is the pen testing job and is there a lack of pen testers? So kind of how do you get involved and, and what's the draw or the uh, demand? That's all you, Dave. Yeah, well, there's, you know, I, get, I actually get asked this question all the time, um, which doesn't surprise me. I mean, I teach classes all the time, and, and, you know, everybody's interested in furthering their careers, certainly students that are learning new skills and advancing themselves. That's a key area for them. Um, so many ways. Pen testing is a little bit more difficult to just sort of step into, but I would say there's a lot of ways to sort of move in that direction. Number one, I mean, if you already work in an organization that's, potentially open to doing some internal testing, that is always your best avenue because you're already there. Uh, you know, uh, hypothetically, you're a trusted member of the workforce and people know you, and so you can sort of begin that route in your own, uh, in your own world that you live in. Um, if that's not the case, what you may want to do is look at opportunities to potentially do sort of free work or you know, kind of gratis work for civic organizations. So go to your church, go to your synagogue, go to uh, you know a sporting club or someplace, play, someplace that you frequent that might really appreciate some pro bono security work, and um, you can use that if they'll give you a reference. And so you can sort of say, hey, look, I've done this type of work, uh, and and in fact, for just beginners getting into the field, that's proven to be a really effective way to just build up a bit of a uh, of a repertoire without having done the actual work in an enterprise uh, at that point. Um, if you're young and you know sort of just getting started, there's always intern routes, particularly with um, some of the larger consulting organizations that are out there, uh, or even the boutique organizations that sort of always need people to jump in and get involved. That's another place that I would recommend going. So pen testing is a growing discipline, and it's becoming much more sort of accepted practically within even fairly conservative enterprises because we need to know this stuff. We've got to figure out how we can recognize these attacks more effectively and more commonly. And, and you know, you can't wait until you actually get attacked to do so. So we've got to emulate this stuff ourselves, and that's where pen testing comes in. So. Those are all just ideas, but um, there, there's certainly more of this happening all the time. All right. Well, with that, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Dave and Lance, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, you can visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.